Welcome to the Mean Lady Talking Podcast. This is the podcast that tackles tough questions about relationships, life, love, and loss. It may not be the advice you want, but it's probably the advice you need. And now here's your host, grief therapist, motivational speaker, relationship expert, best-selling author, and attorney, the not really mean, mean lady herself, Susan J. Elliott. Good day, everybody. This is Susan Elliott, host of the Mean Lady Talking Podcast, and it's a Friday show. Mean Lady Talking, episode 28. And we're having a lot of thunderstorms here in New York. We've been having them all week. We've been having them all day. So I am going to interrupt the broadcast if the thunder and lightning gets to be too much or takes my internet down, which it has done several times this summer. And I've been trying to turn off the router, and protect all my devices during these wacko thunderstorms. And I have some really great listener letters today. So I'm going to get to them without any more delay. Now, there's two letters, and I think that everybody could identify with one or the other. The first one is about a co-parent being disrespectful in front of the children to the children. And that's a drumbeat that I have pounded on for the past few podcasts, actually. And the reader actually comes from a jurisdiction that I'm familiar with. And I understand exactly what the jurisprudence in that particular state has been moving toward. I've also been very rough on parenting coordinators, and they have a case in the state that talks about a parenting coordinator who did everything right. The family court judge did everything right, trying to deal with a co-parent who was not doing what she needed to do. I've only had a little bit of time to review the case that I was thinking of when I got this letter, and I haven't prepared any real notes for this podcast because I received another one just recently about a breakup, somebody who was feeling somewhat ashamed of her behavior during the last argument and also losing connection with his children. So the things that she wanted to talk about was coming to terms with losing the attachment to the children and losing the the children and how to deal with the way she behaved in their last conversation when she was beating herself up about. So I want to get to the first one because this really sounds like a person who has personality disorder, not the writer, the person. Okay, so this is the question. I think my ex-husband has narcissistic personality disorder. We have been separated for four years and legally divorced for months. I left him and never regretted that. We share a six-year-old daughter. The last two times we had to be there for our daughter in the same room, he was verbally abusive to me. I ignored his comments and just wanted to be near her side. On the second occasion, I walked away, and when she was at a hearing range, I asked him if he could please hide his anger toward me in front of her a little better. And I told him that my daughter said, why does daddy hate you? He ignored me and shut off all communication. I only communicate with him about her, and I keep all my communications with him to a bare minimum already. Should I just wait out this wave of silent treatment, or should I attempt minimum contact? Should I even go further with no contact? In other words, give up on both of us attending anything where our daughter would like both of us. I'm not sure that my daughter is benefiting from both of us being there. Also, how should I have answered the question, why does daddy hate you? I told her he doesn't hate me and we are friends, but clearly she sees that isn't true. In retrospect, maybe it was silly of me to think that asking him to control his anger better would actually result in him changing his behavior. Should I attempt to document that he has ignored two texts about drop-off? Well, first of all, I think that if you've been separated this long and you've been divorced for a month, I would be really surprised if there's no parenting agreement in place. There should be a parenting agreement in place, and there absolutely should be an agreement that he is supposed to be following. And drop-offs 
and pickups should absolutely be in writing. And what I have said for all parents, whether your ex is personality disordered or not, whether you and your ex have a friendly relationship or not, you are not together for a reason. You don't mesh well together. You see things differently. Whatever it is, there are reasons why you're not together. So even if you've tried to have a friendly relationship, I know that there are many professionals, both mental health professionals and legal professionals, who seem to be unaware of how wrong things can go when parents are in communication with each other on a frequent basis. I really don't believe in it. I really believe that children need to accept the separation of parents, separation of households as a fact of life. If you don't make a big deal about it or you don't try to push for something that's fake or doesn't really exist, you're not going to confuse the kids. Kids who grow up in two, with two parents in two different households with two separate rules and doing things differently, they adjust to that. They understand that. Okay, this is mom's house. This is how I do it. This is dad's house. This is how I do it. The kids do not get confused. A lot of times parents are turning themselves inside out on these somewhat fictional beliefs about their kids. Oh, it'll be better for the kids if I did this. It'll be better for the kids if I did that. And that is not always true. And I've also seen a lot of legal professionals that have absolutely no training in the therapy field. And I'm calling out my fellow lawyers. Stop telling parents that you should be in frequent communication for the sake of the children. No, you should not. The more frequent your communication, the more chance there is for miscommunication, for disagreements, for arguing, for lots of things that should not go on anymore. The reason that you should have everything spelled out to the letter is because parents rarely agree on things. And then if you bring your ex back into court and there's something that wasn't spelled out in the agreement, the court will usually look for the way the parties behaved previously. An example of that is I had a client who every summer she paid for her son's airfare to his father's one way and the father paid the other way. One paid for going, one paid for coming. And then all of a sudden in the last summer he decided he wasn't paying at all so it was not in any of the agreements they have a parenting plan they have a parenting agreement they have a parenting coordinator they have all kinds of stuff they've been in and out of court all the time because he is absolutely personality disordered and I said to her just write down in I language this is how we've done it I realize that it's not spelled out in the agreement but the legal phrase you want to use is the previous conduct of the parties has been and then she laid out all the years where she paid one way he paid the other way and she of course had an expectation of him doing the same thing this year and he just pulled out the rug so again you probably won't call your ex into court over something like that but it goes on the list and I've talked about this in other podcasts you don't say to your ex I'm going to charge you a contempt of court but you say something to the effect of, I truly believe that this has been our previous unwritten agreement. This is how we behave. This is what I expected. This is how I expected us to behave this year as well. Please honor the verbal agreement we've had in the past because his behavior clearly showed that that was their agreement. So she's not going to haul him into court over this one plain ticket but she's going to put it on the list of things that she feels entitled to repayment for at some point and I've said if you want to tell your ex something to the effect of I will expect payment and if you don't agree with that at some point we're going to have to have the court sorted out in that way you're not threatening them with contempt of court because contempt of court is an inflammatory phrase and people get all jacked up about it and you don't want a person with personality disorder to come back oh you're threatening me blah 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 blah. you know how they are and that's what they're gonna do okay this divorce is so new there must be something in the parenting agreement if there's not you got to get right back into court that a drop off and pick up times are previously agreed to you shouldn't be texting each other about dropping off and picking up it should be you pick up here I pick up there you drop off here I drop off there it has to be set in stone it's 
especially if you have personality disorder X. It absolutely has to be set in stone. And if the divorce is that new, you just go back into court and you say, Your Honor, I tried to work this out. I texted him and ignored it. And I really need this to be clear. I really need clarification on this. The other thing is that no court is going to put up with one parent verbally abusing the other in front of the children and not heeding the child's words, why does daddy hate you? Those things courts take extremely seriously. It's very bad behavior. It's really upsetting. It's upsetting to the children and the courts don't like it. I would absolutely haul this stuff right into court and say we need a parenting agreement and we need to stick to drop off and pick off. You cannot, cannot, cannot have something like this with somebody who is that uncooperative and leave it open. It should be drop off is here, pick up is there. Drop off is here on Friday, pick up is there on Saturday or Sunday or whenever it is. It has to be set in stone. I did this with my ex for 10 years. Drop off was 7 o'clock on Friday, pick up was 5 o'clock on Sunday. That was it. We met in the same place, a little strip mall, every other weekend for 10 years. It never, ever changed. And if I couldn't do it, then a third party would do it. If if he couldn't do it, a third party would do it. But we made sure we never, ever, ever changed that schedule because we couldn't agree on anything. We couldn't agree on the color of the sky. We did nothing that we ever had to discuss anything about because it just wouldn't work. Now, one of the things that I want to talk about is I said to this woman, where are you located? And she said, Massachusetts. Now, I know that I have, I've been ragging on judges, lawyers, parents and coordinators, social workers, therapists, CPS, everybody in my last few podcasts. But there is a case in Massachusetts that is the seminal case of how these things should be handled. And it floors me that the woman in this case brought this to the Massachusetts Court of Appeals. It just, it's just amazing to me that she did as many things as she did and then appealed this decision. The case that I'm thinking of, and I read this, and I read it Because a friend of mine who is a parenting coordinator, not in Massachusetts, but in Rhode Island, sent this to me and said, you're always ragging us on us parenting coordinators. And I'm not always ragging on parenting coordinators. I'm ragging on clueless parenting coordinators. Like this woman just said they've been divorced four years. And why is her ex holding on to this anger? This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. And I talked about another case where the parenting coordinator said to the woman who was objecting to the tone and the insults of her ex and email, the parenting coordinator actually said, well, he's still angry. Well, it was three years since their divorce. Get over it. Those are the parenting coordinators that I rag on. But this was an excellent parenting coordinator, an excellent attorney, an excellent judge. So I want to explain to everybody the case. And if you have a lawyer, if you have a parenting coordinator, if you have a judge and you're in another state, just please pull this this case, tell them to pull the case. It is called Leon versus Cormier. Now, as far as I can tell, everything, everything was done correctly down below. When I say down below, I mean in the family court. The mother hired an attorney to appeal the decision. She was represented by a lawyer. The father represented himself in the appeal case. And because I have a lot of respect for what went on in this case, and it really highlights everything that I believe in and everything I've been telling people, I'd like to read as much of it to you as I can and I'll try not to go into legalese or anything or if there's legalese I'll explain to you what it means. The family court judge held the mother Jessica Cormier in civil contempt for violations 
of an agreed upon parenting coordinator's order. The mother argued that the parenting coordinator's decision was not an order of judgment and therefore could not be enforced by a finding of contempt. The Court of Appeals reviewed what happened and the Court of Appeals said we conclude that the parenting coordinator's decision was, in fact, in order of the court pursuant to the judgment of divorce. Therefore, it was enforceable and therefore they affirmed the decision of the lower court. Now I'll explain to you the facts of the case that you need to know in order to understand the judgment of the appeals court. They executed a separation agreement, the parents. In the separation agreement, they provided, among other things, Sometimes you'll read in a case, it'll say interalia. Interalia just means among other things. So among other things, they decided that they could modify the parenting plan by agreement. And in doing so, they would agree to use a mutually selected parenting coordinator to assist them whenever they were unable to agree on matters relating to the parenting plan. So they had a parenting plan in place, and this is where things really need to be set in stone. And people will say to me, oh, I don't want to do the minutia, the this and that. No, 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 do the minutia. The more minutia you do in the parenting plan, the better off everybody's going to be. You know exactly what's going to go on and when. They also agreed in the separation agreement that they would mutually agree on a parenting coordinator and that they would mutually agree that the decisions of the parenting coordinator would be binding on the parties unless, it was modified by the court. In this agreement, they were looking, as far as I could see, as many stopgap measures as they could. Somebody was looking at what if, what if, what if, what if, and that's an excellent way to construct any parenting agreement, any divorce agreement. You do what if, what if, what if. And what they said was, if You don't agree with the decision of the parenting coordinator. Now, in this case, and in a lot of cases, the parenting coordinator acts as a referee. I say that Johnny goes to school over here, and you say Johnny goes to school over there. Johnny lives an equal distance from each school. What do we do? I want Johnny to go here. You want Johnny to go there. We go to the parenting coordinator. What does the parenting coordinator say? Parenting coordinator says, oh, Johnny's going to go to this school. The other parent says, I don't like that. I'm going to go bring it to court and say, I I don't agree with this decision. They put that in this agreement. They said, if one of us doesn't agree with the parenting coordinator, we have the right to go to court and ask the court to review it. Everything, everything, everything was resolved. A, we have a parenting plan. B, we have a parenting coordinator. C, we agree in advance to abide by the decision of the parenting coordinator. And if for some crazy reason, even though we put all these agreements in place, if for some crazy reason we just don't get our way, we want to go to court, okay, could go to court. But the court is trying to put the parenting coordinator in its place so that these people are not running in and out of court. Now, they came up with the parenting agreement. They came up with the mutually selected parenting coordinator. The parenting coordinator, very, very wise parenting coordinator, says, These are the details of future visitation exchanges. This is also details of how email communication is going to go. Knowing how things have gone in the past, the parenting coordinator said, One drop-off will be in Chelmsford, Massachusetts, and one drop-off off will be in Pepperell, Massachusetts. So it's like I said at the beginning, one person lived in Pepperell, one person lived in Chelmsford. It's very even. It's, you know, both people are doing the same amount of driving. And they had the drop off and pick up at the Chelmsford Police Department or the Pepperell Police Department. Now, I don't know if you know Massachusetts, but Chelmsford and Pepperell are not terribly close to each other. So someone's going to be driving and they're each going to be doing it 
in a police station. Okay, so that's that's the agreement. That's an excellent agreement. I like it. I think I've told you guys that I've run as parents and coordinators who think that, oh, it's all traumatic for kids to be dropped off and picked up at police stations, and it's not. And if you think that it is, do a little strip mall, make it as public as you can so that people aren't fighting or whatever. But police stations are the most safe place. The parenting coordinator also limited, and I love this because this is something I suggest as a therapist and as a lawyer, I suggest it all the time. The time, the content of, and the length of emails. She could only send emails on Tuesdays. They could only email on Tuesdays and they had to be necessary emails. There was not to be any insults. There was not to be any anger. There was no discussion about third parties or relatives or anything. This is absolutely excellent. This is what I beat the drum of all the time. The only exception was a significant emergency or a necessary change in logistics that had to be established before the following Tuesday. So that was it. Everything in this case was just set in stone the way I say it should be. The judge was on board. The attorneys were on board. The parenting coordinator was on board. The father was on board. Guess what? The mother, not on board. So the father filed three complaints for contempt, one which was thrown out because it just seemed to be a repeat of the other two. But the the father was representing himself. So these are things that that people who are not lawyers would make. So the first contempt was for the alleged violations of the email communication. And the other one was the violation of the visitation exchange protocol. So they go to the contempt hearing. Mother doesn't have an attorney. Father doesn't have an attorney. Mother had an attorney for the appeals case. So the mother, and I said this in my very last podcast about the personality disorder. I said, personality disorder, they didn't get served. They didn't get noticed. They didn't get this. They didn't get that. This is a, this is a prime example of that. The father had attached as exhibits, which is what you have to do when you file a brief with the court, you have to give evidence as to what you're talking about. You have to give evidence to support your position. So he had attached all of her emails within three months. Now she's supposed to be sending emails only on Tuesday and only if necessary. And they have to be very sane and deal only with logistics and things like that. Those were the parameters that the mother was restricted to by the parenting coordinator and in effect by the court. So between December 23rd and February 25th, the mother had sent, are you ready for this? 70 emails. 70 emails. There's only like 10 Tuesdays between December 23rd and February 25th. I didn't count them all, but there's like 10 Tuesdays. She sent 70, 70 emails. On top of that, she used all caps, complained about her inability to deal with the father, and used big block letters, which people consider to be shouting where she said things such as my children in big capital letters and all of her issues that she had with him all of these things which the very smart parenting coordinator said does not belong in emails it just doesn't 70 70 the other thing that the father filed for com- contempt over was that she would go to the Pepperell police station, I assume that's where she lived, and say this is where the kids are. She would not go to Chelmsford like she was supposed to. Now, to get back to what she claimed she didn't get, the father's contempt complaint attached all of her emails as his evidence of her being in contempt. She complained that she didn't have a copy of the emails. And I can tell you that this is what the personality disorder do. I don't have a copy. I didn't get noticed. Bah, bah, bah. If the personality disorder says I didn't get noticed, a lot of times judge it's a constitutional right. It's not, it's not anything that's a small matter. Notice in a hearing is a constitutional right. Most judges 
will stay the hearing to another time. But what this judge did, and I love this, this judge said, ma'am, you wrote the emails. You know what they said. I was like, hallelujah, a judge with a brain. Oh, my God. So, but the judge also gave her an out. The judge said, you know, if you really need to look over the emails that he attached, we can give you copies of them, and then we could have a hearing another day. So the judge gave the mother all the leeway that she asked for and then the mother said okay let's let's just get over with this today so the mother said that she did not violate the orders of the court because the order was from the parenting coordinator and the parenting coordinator had no judicial authority over the parties the mother's said that the judge erred in treating the parenting coordinator's decision as a court order. She said that the parenting coordinator's decisions had no legal weight because it had not been previously approved by the court. And she also stated that it's the father's responsibility to seek judicial approval of the parenting coordinator's decision and to have it entered as a court order before it could be enforced. And the appeals court said, absolutely not. The appeals court said, it's undisputed that the separation agreement provided that the parties freely granted consent to the parenting coordinator to make decisions that they would both be bound by. But there was a clause that said, if either party does not agree with the parenting coordinator, they can seek the judicial aid of the court of any disputed order. So what the mother was saying was the father had to go get judicial blessing for an agreement that they made. And the court said, no, the wording is that the only time you come into court is when you disagree. If you disagree, you were supposed to come into court, not the father to say, your honor, bless this agreement. So she was totally out in left field. And I can't even believe she had a lawyer that was arguing this nonsense. So there were all these safeties built in for the mother that she just completely twisted. The mother said that there had to be clear and undoubted disobedience of a clear and unequivocal command from the court. And the court said, no, you guys agreed to appoint the parenting coordinator and to be bound by their decision. And if you're not, then you're in contempt of court because what flowed from the court agreements was the authority of the parenting coordinator. The family court judge determined that the language that the parties agreed to was to be bound by the decision of the parenting coordinator. And if they felt they weren't going to be bound, then there was absolutely no point to having a parenting coordinator. The Court of Appeals agreed with the family court judge who said that the mother's emails were hostile and dictatorial. And the judge said, the family court judge said, that is counterproductive to effective parenting. And every judge in this country, and any other country, should understand that that is absolutely, absolutely, absolutely the way it should be. There should not be any hostile communication. There should not be anything that a six-year-old is picking up that your father hates your mother. That is absolutely not good for the children. In Leon versus Cormier, the family court judge said, if the mother continued to violate the parenting coordinator's order relating to email communications, her parenting time might be suspended until she addressed her behavior with a family therapist. I almost like stood up reading this, this decision from the Court of Appeals. I almost stood up and applauded. And the family court judge gave the father 12 days additional parenting time and made the mother pay the father's court cost. And that's exactly what needs to happen because too often these things go unchecked. Nobody pays attention and they just get away with whatever they want to get away with. This was the parenting coordinator put restraints on the mother who sent 70 emails and also in contempt of the visitation drop-off 
and pick up. It's not okay. And mothers and fathers should not be having these dysfunctional communications. This kid is six. I mean, at the very least, they're going to have to talk until she's 18, maybe 21, maybe 23, depending on how far she goes in college. That's a long time to be treated this way. No judge should sit back while a parent is hostile to another parent or calls another parent names. Now, some people will say, well, the kids don't really hear it. You know, this is a case where the kids heard it. But a lot of times people will say, well, the kids don't really hear it. But a lot of judges, I'm so thankful to hear that they're beginning to understand that if you're stressed out because your ex is ragging on you and calling your names and stressing you out and you don't know what they're going to do next, and you don't know if they're going to really adhere to the pick off and drop off, you're, you're stressed and that stress is going to affect your child, whether your child knows what it's about or not. So parents should not be stressing each other out. They just shouldn't. So any legal professional, family therapist, whoever it is who says that parents should be in frequent communication are completely out of their minds. There should be as little communication as possible. Everything should be in writing. Everything, everything, everything should be in writing. And if I were the woman with the six-year-old child, I would absolutely be right back in court and say, we really need to clarify this, Your Honor, because he is speaking to me in this tone. My daughter thinks that he hates me. And now I'm trying to tell my daughter he doesn't hate me. And now she thinks I'm lying to her. This cannot be. And most most judges will agree with you. It's not good for the children. And it's not good for him to give hostile language to you, even if it's not in front of the children. It's not okay. There are some people that seem to think, well, you know, the kids don't really hear it. I don't believe it. I think that there should never, ever, ever be anger four years after you've separated, three years after you've separated, whatever it is. Your anger belongs to you and your therapist. It doesn't belong to your co-parent. I don't care what they did. You should not still be pushing your anger on them three and four years later. And if you have a six-year-old child, you're going to have a lot of years with this bozo. So please get into court. Please insist on an order where there has to be civil discourse and that there is not to be any verbal abuse in front of the child ever and that there is to be no verbal abuse Period. Emails should definitely be limited to time, content, and necessity. And there should not be any questions about drop off and pick up. None. You should have this day, this is drop off, this day, this is pick up. Set in stone. Never ever veer from it. Don't ever say yes to a change. The only time you want to say yes to a change is if the child is sick. That's the only time you want to say yes to a change. Other than that, you don't want to say yes to a change. So now I'm all worked up about that, but I'm so happy that I have this Leon versus Cormier because everybody did the right thing. The family court judge did the right thing. The parenting coordinator did the right thing. The father did the right thing. The mother did the wrong thing. And she got whacked by the court for it. She got penalized. For her bad behavior by the court. That's exactly what should have been done. Anyway, there was good stuff all around. And I suggest that if you're in another state, you take this case from the Massachusetts Court of Appeals. It's called Leon versus Cormier. It was it was decided March 24th, 2017. So it's about a year and a half old. I really urge everybody to, if you're having any sort of problems with a, a lawyer, a judge, a parenting coordinator, you take this and you show this to somebody and say, this is what I want. I want the same kind of relief that this guy got in this case. I want the emails limited. I want the communication limited. I want the pick up and drop off to be set in stone. That's what I want. Okay. So that's my rant on that. Okay. The next one. Okay. So the second one was Getting past your breakup was my Bible when my husband suddenly left me after 13 years. We had four small children and a very hard time trying to make, and I had a very hard time trying to make sense of it all and not get caught up in my ex's chaotic life after he left. I was dealing with so much and found the journaling and no contact particularly helpful in enabling me to process things and not get caught up in the insults and airing of bad feelings over the phone calls and messages. Keeping my side of the street clean, as you say, has meant that he has nothing to retaliate against and meant I could keep my head together when we had to make constructive decisions about our children. A year or so later, I got friendly with a mutual friend and we fell for each other in a big way. It was nice to have love back in my life, 
one of the things I put on my list of wants for a new relationship was that I wanted to have somebody who had a good relationship with their own children so that they would understand that my children always come first and that there was no room for compromise on this. And that's an excellent thing. I mean, I never dated guys who had children until I met Michael. My kids were older then, but when my kids were little, they they were in too much competition with their father's stepchildren, and I just wouldn't put them in that situation. I turned down a lot of guys that I really liked because I was asked, out by this one guy and he had his son was named Nicholas and my son was named Nicholas and they were both five and I really liked this guy so much and he was a good father but I said you know my middle son had a stepbrother his age and always felt like his father was favoring the stepbrother I couldn't do that to my younger child even though I didn't think that that would happen I just couldn't do it so until I met my husband Michael I never dated a guy that had kids at all but she's saying that she wants somebody to understand that her kids come first and that's what when Michael and I met each other we both felt that way like our kids come first so the new guy was an excellent father and our children of the same ages became very good friends well that's nice but as the relationship moved forward I noticed that he was unable to communicate things whenever we had a disagreement and he would storm off in a huff and I wouldn't hear from him for a few days then he contacted me as if nothing happened and he would insist that he didn't want me dragging it all up again. I I've dealt with this, and I, I had a little relationship for this exact reason, because I couldn't handle it. I should have drawn a line then as being emotionally mature and able to communicate while also on my must-have list. So she's saying that she also wanted somebody who was emotionally mature and able to communicate, and him going off in a huff and coming back was not emotionally mature, and it wasn't. Things peaked when he was grumpy one morning because he couldn't find his car keys and his car was blocking mine in. This made me late to take my daughter to her dad and he had to come to collect her instead. I don't know if the guy felt embarrassed, but when he eventually found his keys, he stormed off, sending me a breakup message shortly after. Wonderful, there goes that maturity. I questioned him on what on earth was happening and how did he come to that decision and then he sent me a series of messages saying how my kids were this and that and I was this and that. Things he never mentioned before. And I can tell you that when people storm off in a huff and then they just stew and then they don't want to talk about this, exactly what they do. They do scenarios in their head. This was four days before we were due to go on holiday together. I'm not a good flyer anyway, and the thought of taking four kids away on my own terrified me. I spent those four days crying and feeling like I was letting my children down by not taking them on holiday. It was eventually their understanding and maturity that gave me the strength to take them away after all. Oh, that's nice. I'm glad I did because despite the turmoil I was feeling, we had a good time. My children really dug deep to work as a team and make sure we were all listening to each other and keeping happy and safe. That's wonderful. I love it. I started reading your books again and thought a lot about why the relationship would never work. Nonetheless, he did get in contact when I got home and we chatted for a while. Him saying he loved and missed me, but because he couldn't accept or even talk about the way he let me down, I wasn't prepared to let the relationship go any further. I bumped into this guy about six weeks later when I was out with mutual friends. He was really chatty with me, but I had my guard up after everything that happened. He was with his children, who I care about a lot and had missed so much. We did sort of get back to seeing each other again, but my heart wasn't in it. Last week, he came over. We went out together. I had so many things still on my mind and boundaries I put in place that we were clashing and simple things about him that I liked before was simply making me feel cross now and even a little controlled. He wasn't controlling. I was just pretty easygoing before, and now I was standing my ground on things like my life depended on it. That night, we had a huge row, partly about a big life event we went through together that I'm still dealing with and I want to talk about, and then also lots of the many unsaid things started to come up too. All that built-up emotion I had been bottling up came out, and I behaved really terribly. I was trying to throw things out of the window, calling him names and pushing him away. I never behaved like that in my life and this came as a shock to me part of dealing with my breakup is also coming to terms with my own behavior normally when he leaves and doesn't contact me for ages i keep everything above board stay fair but firm and only say the things i truly mean this time however i didn't even recognize myself i apologize the next morning for my part in the escalation of the round we left it there so my main issues i'm trying to cope with now are how do I come to terms with losing his lovely children and not being a part of their lives anymore my, while my children still want to stay in touch with them? 
I don't want to say they can't all be friends, but it hurts hearing about them, and I don't know how to manage this going forward. Two, what can I do about the way I behaved the last time I saw him? I said I was sorry, and I wasn't planning on contacting him again, but it's more about feeling guilty for my irrational behavior and accepting that I'm capable of that. I don't want to ever feel or respond like that again, and it's hard to come with, to terms with the fact that I did. I don't want any issues of messed upness to be carried along with me into the future. I'm a talker, and that's how I work through things. No name calling over reaction, just honestly to the fact that I did all those things at the end is making me doubt if I know myself. Many thanks for all you do. The podcast has been a real gem. Thank you so much for this letter. I really appreciate it. I was in I was in this exact relationship and it used to drive me crazy. I was just thinking about this the other day because I would want to discuss something and he would feel that discussing it was arguing. And I would say, I'm not arguing like when when you think one thing and I think something else, we need to talk about it. And he would go, I don't like to argue. Don't like to argue. I don't like to argue. And what happens is that you start to suppress everything. And there's all these things that are not said. And what happened to you happened to me. I just went brrrm, straight out. Here you go. Verbal diarrhea. This is everything I ever thought about you. And go suck an egg. And that's what happens when you are shut down. Mature adults talk about things. You cannot be in a relationship with somebody who storms off and comes back when they're done and they don't want to discuss it again. You have no idea what happened. You have no idea what's going to happen the next time the same thing comes up because a lot of times these are unresolved issues and they come up all the time. I know that's what happened in my relationship. And I talk about it in getting past your breakup. We couldn't talk about the schedule. And it was like you would think that I was trying to figure out when to launch an atomic attack on another country. You know, it's like he would just get like inflamed whenever I bring it up. And he would say, I don't want to talk. I don't want to talk. I don't want to argue. And I would say, what do you mean you don't want to argue? Like, we have to figure this out. No, we don't have to figure it out. We don't have to figure this out. He just wanted to fly by the seat of his pants. And I had kids. He didn't have custody of any of his kids. He saw his kids whenever the hell he felt like it. So I had two weekends every month that I was free. And I wanted to know if we were going to see each other or not. And he couldn't commit to that. And I was like, well, you know, we need to talk about this. Because if we can't do this, we don't have a relationship. We didn't want to talk. We eventually didn't have a relationship. So I think that one of the things that happened here is that you were so bottled up and so frustrated by his behavior, which was not emotionally mature, is absolutely stupid, that you eventually let him have it. That's what happened. And the way that you learn from this is that you know that that style is not going to work for you. The first time somebody says, I don't want to talk about this, or they grab the keys and storm off and come back a few days later and they don't want to revisit it, you know, that's it. It's over. Goodbye. You know that you should have walked at that first episode. And that's exactly what you should have done. And that's the lesson that you need to take from this. You also need to take from this when you talk to new people and you're dating new people. You need to say, how do you deal with disagreements? Do you want to talk it out? And getting back out there, I talk about the couple who she wanted to be left alone for a few hours, maybe even to the next day. He wanted to talk about it and he would walk around behind it going, can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk? Their styles clash. But what we did was with them, I had them come to an agreement of, okay, how much time do you need to cool down? She wanted two days or 10 hours or whatever. And she said, give me an hour and then come in and see if I'm ready to talk. So he would go bananas when she was by herself thinking and, you know, calming down. And she couldn't talk. She couldn't think when she was that worked up. So they had to come to a compromise because he could not handle her storming off and not talking to him for a couple of days or even a few hours. Like he just couldn't handle it. He was losing it. So the solution was, how about they had little code words? She would get to a point. She'd go, look, I need to sit by myself for a while. That was all she'd say. Then she'd go off and he'd be like, Err, sitting with himself, but understanding she needed some time to cool down. After about 45 minutes, he would go and say, how you doing, hon? Do you want to talk about this? You know, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes she did. Sometimes she didn't. Give me another half an hour or so. So they each had to work on it. He had to work on being okay with her going off for a short period of time. And she had to be, get herself together, kind of force it, you know, instead of sitting there stewing on everything, she had to force herself to call 
calm down and come back to him in a timely manner because she loved him. She had to put some effort into talking in a reasonable amount of time. And that's the key, reasonable. And I talk about this all the time. You know, in the law, as an attorney, I learned in first year law school, it's the reasonable person standard. What would a reasonable person do? So a guy who picks up his keys and storms off, comes back two days later, doesn't want to talk, not reasonable, not reasonable at all. You wanting him to stay there and talk everything out right then and there, not reasonable. What do you do? You have to figure out if this situation is changeable or not. If you go to the workbook or getting back out there, I have the concept of accept to change or to leave. The way he was communicating, you couldn't accept it and you didn't leave right away. So you try to change it. I cannot deal with it when you take your keys, storm off and don't talk to me for two days. If he says, too bad, that's the way it's going to be, whether you like it or not, then you have your answer. This person is not interested in working on anything. There has to be give and take in a situation like that. So I wouldn't worry about the fact that you don't know yourself. I would worry about the fact that you cannot be in a situation like that. I know that there are certain situations that make me crazy, that I will be screaming and yelling at somebody if I am exposed to this level of behavior, this level of communication. I'm going to be a crazy person. I keep those people out of my life. There are just some people who operate on level I can't handle, I can't deal with. And I will go off like a lunatic if I'm exposed to their dysfunctional way of dealing with things. So you learn that about yourself. I can't do this. I can't keep all this stuff bottled up. I cannot because it's going to come out and it's going to, you know, smack them in the face. You have to look at your behavior. What you did wrong was you put up with this emotionally immature, ridiculous behavior of his. You didn't call him on it and you didn't leave. You didn't try to change it. Or if you did try to change it, you didn't leave when you realized it wasn't going to change. And that's what you need to know. You need to know that a person's style of communication, I talk about this in getting back out there. You need to know what are your styles of communication when things go wrong, not when things go right. It's like, I cannot say this often enough. You have to have the same kind of styles for working out communication or you have to agree on a third style that nobody's real happy with, but nobody's terribly unhappy with. So that's what you have to do. You have to say, I need to find this out early. I cannot handle a little boy who grabs his car keys and goes storming off. I cannot do that. I need to talk about it. And if he's got a head full of steam and he can't talk about it now, we need to talk about how long do you need. But two days is not of silence is not okay. That doesn't work. It's dysfunctional. I can't do it. So that's what you need to do. You need to be pickier about the people that you're with. And you need to talk about communication styles with disagreements earlier on. So that's what you need to do. About the kids, I don't know if your kids can be friends with his kids, but I would just tell the kids and I would just appreciate He and I don't have a future relationship, so I would appreciate it if you don't share with me anything about them. If you want to continue to be friends with them, that's fine, but I really need to move on and that has to be it. We all have secondary losses when we lose a relationship, and many times it is about somebody else's children or family or something like that. Dating a guy, and he was a, a loser. You know, the only way I can describe it was he was a loser, but I loved his family, and I loved his friends, and I had such a great time. And when I would go there, and it was a long-distance relationship, so I would go up there on the weekends when I didn't have the kids, we hung out at this pub. It was sort of like cheers. I mean, everybody knew everybody, and this is where they hung out, and I went up there, and I wasn't drinking, but I had such a great time. And it felt like where everybody knows your name, and everybody loved me you know I'd walk in and they didn't go norm but you know they were like hey how you doing how, how are things down in Massachusetts but when I lived in Massachusetts so I really struggled with breaking up with this guy because I loved his family his mother never had a daughter and the guy's ex-wife was not somebody that the mother was fond of the mother loved me loved me loved me his best friends loved me, loved me, loved me. Everybody in the pub loved me, loved me. I don't want to say, could I move here and make him move to some other town? 
but there's always the secondary losses and you have to do when you do your relationship inventory and you have to write about it you have to talk about it you have to grieve it you have to let it go I can't tell you what to do with the kids just tell them however they're going to work it out with his kids be friends or whatever try to treat them as just school friends got to tell the kids I'm glad you guys still talk to each other care about each other whatever it is but it would really help me moving on if we don't talk about it and then that will help them you can say to them if you have questions about our breakup that you need answered I will talk to you about that I just don't want to talk to you about his kids that's all I'm just having a difficult time letting it go and for my own healing and then you teach the kids you know there are steps moving on so anyway if either of the today's letter writers have questions comments situations they want to add they want to ask questions whatever it is please let me know I know today's uh, podcast went on a little long but I really Really, really, really like both of these questions and I wanted to get them answered as soon as I could. So if you have any questions, comments, situations, please send email me lady talking podcast at gmail.com and you could get on the air too. Thanks a lot, guys. Here from Stormy New York, Susan Elliott, Me and Lady Talking Podcast. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on whatever platform you listen to. Google Play doesn't have reviews, so please go to Stitcher. They have a really cool uh, review review tool. I really like it. So please go to the Facebook page, Mean Lady Talking Podcast Facebook page. Put a review on there. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. Take care, guys. And hey, you can do this. Talk to you all later. Bye-bye.